I'm not okay. Okay. Good morning. Welcome everyone. Welcome back. This is our second lecture on BC three one zero church and ministry administration. We are, we've been talking about culture, the culture of the organization and congregation. Um, and we're talking about how this culture is shaped, how we can be intentional in shaping the culture. Shrikumar, you have a question? Please go ahead. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, my question is uh, regarding to the stories. Um, I just want to know that if uh, if a man of God is having encounters, like, uh, you know, as you shared about one encounters, if you repeat oh, the same thing um, every time. But uh, uh, I just want to know that if a servant of God is having an multiple encounters, I know, you know, day to day life or something like that, which uh, encourages the congregation and uh, which makes the church to believe that, you know, uh, which edify the faith of faith of the congregation on God and uh, which make them to most of the time, um, like when they hear a message, uh, you know, they they know that they, they they feel that yeah that is this this God is somewhere it's working, but sometimes they don't feel it is real. But um, uh, when um, these stories are shared, that multiple encounters happening, uh, my question is, is that is that thing edify the faith of a congregation uh, on God, and uh, when a servant of God having such kind of encounters? Uh, is it okay to share with the congregation? Thank you, sir. That's my question. Um, I think um, see that there's there's nothing wrong. Of course, there's nothing wrong in a minister of God sharing their personal encounters and experiences and. Absolutely nothing wrong. And they definitely encourage, they will definitely encourage the people. Uh, when we talk about personal encounters and so on. But I think the question is, or the concern is, on what are people being established? Ultimately, we want them to be established in God himself, you know, in the word of God, in the power of God, in the working of the Holy Spirit. We don't want them to be established on the leader's personal experiences. And in fact, that is a big problem in the church today. That's a big problem. When I listen to people, you know, I'm thinking just generally, they they know more about what so and so the experience that so and so minister had as compared to the word of God itself. And that is a very dangerous place to be. Because all of us need to be established in God. And the way we are established in God is by being established in His Word and in our personal fellowship with the Holy Spirit. But believers are being, they know more about, you know, what did so and so have, a dream so and so had, the vision so and so had, and the, you know, the personal encounter so and so had. And okay. There's nothing wrong with it. That's beautiful. That's wonderful. But are they established in the Word of God? Do they know the Word of God? Can they fight their own battles with the Word of God? You know, I think that's the concern. And uh, so, as long as we, as leaders, as pastors, as ministers, are you know share or bring forth our, there's nothing wrong with sharing our personal encounters or the visions or the dreams or whatever God gave to us. Nothing wrong with that. But the end result should be to point people back to the Lord and point establish people in God and in their fellowship with God. If the sharing of the testimony serves that purpose, well and good. But the sharing of that encounter is only resulting in people drawing, being more established in the individual 
individual story, I think that's a bad thing. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? Welcome. Anything else? OK, let's go forward. So we're uh, just looking at different ways, and I can move a little quickly now. Um, different ways in which you know we can create, intentionally create the culture. We talked about rituals and practices, and then uh, I think Kennedy shared a, a nice thing they do, which is they celebrate the transition. You know, uh, and I think that's a nice thing. So like this, you can create. You know, you can intentionally create certain practices, rituals, are repeated that affirm certain things things that you want to value. Um, orientation, training. So this is very intentional. You want to repeat and communicate core values. You're reminding people over and over again because people tend to forget that you're, you know these are our core values. So that's something you can intentionally do, bring it up over and over again. That helps shape the culture. Uh, affirming and rewarding behavior that's aligned to the culture. So. Uh, you know, you reward those who, uh, you know, the, the, who embody the norms, the values. And so you not only are rewarding uh, results in terms of numbers or output or work done, but you're also rewarding and affirming and rewarding behavior because you understand that that behavior is influencing culture and culture is very valuable in the organization. So uh, while we're all used to, you know, rewarding um, output in terms of, you know, what, what was accomplished, we should also affirm and reward uh, behavior that's, that expresses, embodies the culture we want to create. You know, if it's somebody did a, you know, a, a, a task to serve somebody, so you reward that, you affirm that, hey, so-and-so did like be, did like this, they served like this, you know, so you, you're affirming that, and that reinforces and strengthens culture. So one of the important things, now I'm, I'm changing, so we've talked about, you know, how do we intentionally shape organizational culture? Uh, we just shared these uh, five simple things. There are, there could be more, ways uh, in which culture is shaped and we can explore them. Now, one of the important things that we, we should try to do is to actually write down what are the values, the core, you know, you could use the word core values, or what is the, the kind of culture we want to have in the organization, if you can write it down, that will be very, very good, right? So usually that is expressed in the in in this technical term, you know, core values. So when people say, you "No know, core values," what are they talking about? They're saying, "Look, this is what our, we want. This is how we want to describe our culture." That's the indirect way of saying it. Right? Then they say, "Core value." I mean, these are the things we want to embody. These are this is the culture we want to create that's what they say and of course technically we call it core values all right but what we're doing is we are capturing the essence of the culture we want to create this is who we want to be as a people so that as we go about doing what we are called to do so try to write it down and so what we did a long time ago is uh, we captured it in this little graphic, um, and then we keep showing this or sharing this graphic at different points, uh, you know, uh, in our documents, in our membership document, it's there, church membership, and volunteers, and, you know, our staff guidelines, different places. We keep showing this again and explaining it, and we keep reminding people about it, saying, this is our these are our core values. In other words, we're saying this is what we want to embody as an organization and as a congregation. And then our actions have to be aligned to this, of course. It's no point, you know, putting it on paper and then not doing it. No. You put it on paper so everybody understands it. But then we our, uh, our behavior, starting from the leadership on, and in all our activities and all our work, 
has to embody uh, or exemplify these core values. And if there is a violation of this, people have to be held responsible. They need to be held accountable, right? So let's just look at it. And, and this is what we are doing. You know, you can come up with your own for your church or Christian organization, whatever works, right? So at the very center, we say our theme is Jesus. That means everything we say and do has to be about Jesus. It's not about the pastor. It's not about our leader. No, it's about Jesus Christ. Right? So when we tell our graphics people, when they do their work, say, hey, don't, don't, don't in, in your graphics, in your promotions, in the website, in things we do, don't make the leader stand out. No, the leader is, you know, somewhere. In fact, for a long time, I told the graphics team, don't use any picture of me or, uh, you know, other past. Like, just really don't put our picture on anything you do. Because we don't want us to be the attention. You, you know, use any of the graphic that's relevant to the sermon title or whatever you're doing, but don't put our picture there. So the only place where we have given permission for them to use the picture of the pastor is in the daily devotional. So you would see they put something there. That's the only place, okay, yeah, you know, so fine. And that was also after a long time. But um, nowhere else. So don't use our pictures anyway, because our focus is to be on Jesus. Our theme is Jesus. So in all our promotions, you know, we don't use pictures. I mean, now I, 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 I know not everybody will agree on that. That's okay, but this is our core value. We want to keep eyes off of the people, off of our leaders, focus on Jesus. Right? So it's an intentional thing that we do. So in the work we do, it's all about Jesus. We don't brag on the pastor or the leader. Now, in certain places, yeah, my name is there, more as a sense of responsibility, that I am. if anything goes wrong, hold me responsible. So in those situations, yeah, my name will be there. For example, on all our books, my name is there. One, because I, I've worked on it. But also, if anybody has any grievance with it, with the content of that book, you know whom to blame. You know, you blame this person or you contact this person. So it's more from a sense of uh, moral and social responsibility. My name is on the books. or uh, So wherever there is, you know, the name, you know, we use the name, but otherwise, that we want to keep the focus on Jesus. Right? Our content is the word. So again, intentionally, in all our preaching, our teaching, we minimize extraneous information, emphasize the word, because ultimately we want people to be established in the word. So even there, you know, stories are good, but stories are secondary. Uh, other information is good, but that other information is secondary. The main content must be the Word of God. Right? Our method, we want to depend on the power of the Holy Spirit, so we have to pray. We have to seek God, be open. Yes, we use tools, we use technology, and I'll share with you, uh, you know, next semester, uh, the different things we do, yeah? Yes, we use those things, but those are just tools. Our dependence is on the Holy Spirit because only He can change hearts and only He can change lives. Then our passion is people. So our passion is not building buildings. Our passion is not, uh, you know, uh, building an organization we, we, because we realize that ultimately it's people who are going to go into eternity, right? That they are what matter. So put them first. What can we do to serve people? What can we do to help people? And everything else we do is only serving this ultimate thing of touching people's lives. That has to be very clear. And what are we all working towards? Christ-likeness. So it's not about numbers. Yeah, yes, we do count people so we can be you no... Know, you know, how we, how we are progressing. Yes, we manage our finances because we want to keep it in order. 
Uh, yes, you know, we do a lot of detailed things, but that's not our goal. Our goal is to help people become like Jesus, Christ likeness. Right? So our goal is not to have a name, not to have fame, not to have, you know, be glamorous, uh, not to have whatever, a lot of other things that we could look at. Um, the real thing that we need to be evaluating, all that we're doing is, are we helping people become more like Jesus? Right? So this is at the very core, the you know, theme, our content, our method, our passion, our goal. And then connected with that in how we practice, you know, uh, and, and this is in order of importance, and they're all equally important. One is we want to give opportunity to as many people as possible. So um, uh, in every area of ministry, it's open. Anybody who is inclined, who has those gifts or whatever's needed, they can, anybody in the congregation, you're welcome to come and be a part of it. So opportunity is open for all. Uh, we don't, um, um, we, you know, there's no partiality or anything. It's just the same thing for everybody. Opportunity is available. Unity. We want to keep us together. So anything that disturbs unity is treated with severity, right? So this is very important. We can't disturb the unity of the body. Integrity, again, is very important. Whatever we do, you know, it's got to be honest. It's got to be clean. Integrity, do it right. Uh, excellence, do it well. Uh, do it to the best that's possible, possibly can be done with what we have. Uh, be excellent in, in, in the work. Uh, pioneering, that means be willing to step out and try new things. It's okay if it's not been done before. It's okay to experiment. It's okay to try it out. So. You know, try something new, come up with new ideas, creative ideas, and then relationship. That means we value uh, relationship amongst ourselves, people, and so on. Um, so these are our core values, right? So in our decision making, in our planning, in our evaluating things, eh, we look at things from this perspective. If any of these core values are violated in some way, we will have to realign ourselves. We'll have to correct ourselves and bring us back and say, hey, that was not right. Put it here because this is our core value and we need to be doing it like this. So this is something we affirm every day on an ongoing basis. That means it's not just there, you know, on paper or some graphic and we forget about it. No, on a day-to-day -day basis, everybody is being motivated along this. And, and the fact is it has to be top-down. That means the leader and the leadership has to be driving this. If the leadership doesn't drive it, if the leadership doesn't hold people to these core values it will it'll just dissipate it'll it'll water down it'll no longer be there it'll just be on paper so as leaders we need to drive it you know so for example uh, this may seem a little ridiculous but you know excellence so if there's something not done well i give feedback you know i'll tell people um, you know um Example: If uh, there were typing mistakes in in uh, in in uh, the media that was projected, you now we give feedback. Say, hey, that spelling was wrong, or whatever, whatever was wrong. You know, we send it. So, and we're not doing it because we are we want to uh, in any way make people feel bad, or we're not doing this to put people down. No, we're doing it because excellence is one of our core values. Or whatever we do, let's do it best. Of course, we will make mistakes. Mistakes will happen, but we need to correct it. So when you see it, that there's a mistake, you point it out. And it's nothing wrong in pointing it out. Just do it lovingly. And there's nothing wrong in receiving correction because we are all working towards excellence. So it just creates that fact. Then, uh, you know, um, 
at a different way, in different levels. For example, worship team, they have a review every immediately after the worship service. What did we do? What did we do right? What did we do? You know, what could we have done better? Um, uh, the, the different teams are given feedback yeah, because we are not perfect. Uh, we can always make improvements, but we need to keep checking ourselves. Somebody else, it's always good to have somebody else tell us that we need to improve or where we can improve. And then, you know, we have to make those changes. So the, I'm just giving an example where the point is these core values are not just things on paper but it has to be part of our thinking on a day-to-day -day basis. It has to be part of what we do, right? We give people opportunities to try out new things. Somebody comes up with an idea, so, okay, go ahead, do it. Of course, you know, you need to give some guidance. It's okay, you know, watch out for this and think about this and okay, go ahead and try it. They try it, it works, great. If it doesn't work, doesn't matter. You know, at least we tried uh, exploring a new idea or a new, uh, new uh, method and didn't work fine no problem and these ideas can come from anybody you know it can come uh, we just open um, so uh, you know we welcome those ideas and then we try to do it and see what happens you know and and, and we're not against well if the idea comes from somebody in the congregation and so on just in the last couple of months we had Quite a few ideas that came from people in the church you know just different ones came up shared things so then we tried it out you know um, some of it involved money like somebody came up with the idea of you know we had recently done a, a sermon series on leadership and then somebody in the congregation came with the idea saying uh, why don't we uh, you know create like a desk display a stand and give it to people in the church whoever you know has, has gone back to the office and they can put it on their office and it could be a conversation starter why don't we try it out so i said sure you know it's it's something new we didn't do that before but uh, so we had the graphic maybe at the desk display made about 250 pieces and we're just trying it out and uh, we said people you know Take it to your office, put it on your desk, and see. You know, if you if if it starts conversation, and we got feedback. You know, people have started having conversations, saying, you know, this is what we learned in church. You can go to the church website for more information. And then, now we're making another fifty more pieces uh, to make it available to the congregation, and so on. So, it was an idea that just came from somebody in the congregation. So, like that, trying out new things. There's no no harm in doing that, and uh, and so on. Okay, so let me pause here. So I kind of explained this already, right? And uh, we will talk about it next. So the point is, if for your church or for your organization, you can think about um, what do you really want to see as part of the culture in your organization? or in your church, or in your congregation. And then you try to forge that, you try to create that. So, uh, and if you can document it and say, this is what we want to see happen. These are the things that describe, or would be descriptors of the culture we want to see created. And then you see how, you know, if you write it down, and then you see how you can communicate. Of course, you need to communicate that with the team and then see how to implement that on an ongoing basis. You know, it takes time to shape these things, but it's good if you can write it down, share it with your team, and then bring it out into practice, right? So if you get together with your leaders and say, hey, what is the culture we want to see here in the congregation or in our Christian organization? What kind of a culture? What would be the descriptors for this? You know, so you write it down and discuss it, think about it, and then try to bring it in, okay? So let me pause here and see if there are any questions or thoughts or anything people want to share, please do so.
Any thoughts? Any questions? Now, I'll just share this one thought and uh, we'll close after that. There was a time uh, we had to work through some challenges in church. Um, and this happened many years ago. So, you know, when in, in the early days, especially when we had started, you know, we, uh, the name of our church is All People's Church, which means we want to welcome everybody. And in those days, I noticed a problem. We had people who had grown up in um, uh, among the young people. We had people who had grown up in the city, urban youth. So they were very, you know, exposed to Western ideas and mannerisms and behavior was very urban. And then we also had youth, young people who were coming into the city from smaller towns, some even from kind of villages, who were moving into the city. They'd come for studies, they'd come for jobs. Mainly they come in, come for study and then they come for the edu education, then they start working. And so we had both these kinds of youth coming to church. So for the people, for the young people who had moved into the city from smaller towns and other areas, they were still, you know, uh, they would dress a certain way, they would behave a certain way. Whereas those who had grown up in the city, they were very different. You know, the way they relate would, you know, were very already already very Western because they grew up in the city. And I began to observe that these young people who had come from smaller towns. You know, it, it, it was almost like we had two youth groups in the city, in our church. The urban youth and you know the youth who had just come into the city. It was almost like they were, you know, they would hang out separately. They would, they didn't, you know, really feel as one. Because their behavior, their mannerisms, the thing are so different. And so, uh, you know, as a pastor, as I'm observing this, I said, you know, what can we do to, you know, help them merge, help them be together? You know, it was it was something that that had to be intentionally addressed. And so then I had to talk. You know, I had to talk with uh, the youth. Uh, especially those grown up in the city, and let's explain to them, hey, this is something I'm observing. This is a challenge. We want them, we want you to welcome, be welcoming to them. And there are certain changes you need to make to welcome them because they're being put off or they're being turned away because of this certain behavior, which they are not accustomed to, you know. And so we had to. You know, at that time, uh, I'm going back almost. Um, so we talk about 2006, seven, something those that range. So that's yeah, almost 16 years ago, 15, 16 years ago. So um, I had to intentionally address that and say, you know, and 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 speak to this group of young people and say, hey, you see this, this is a difference. You can see that a lot of young people coming in, you need to, you know, be open, you need to welcome them, you need to be, you know, you need to modify your behavior a little bit in certain areas in order to be able to welcome them and make them feel comfortable. So this is an example where you know, you are watching over the culture of what's happening, the dynamic of what's happening in the congregation, and then you're addressing it, you know. And now it took a little while, uh, and, and then, you know, slowly things change. And today, even recently, when I was discussing with our new youth pastor, you know, we transitioned and uh, another young person has taken over being as youth pastor. So I spoke to him, I said, you know, you intentionally select so and so and so and so as leaders, make them part of your 
your leadership team because of this reason. That person comes from uh, that kind of a background, so he will be able to relate to people who are coming into the city from smaller towns. And so even now, you know, we're very intentional, you know, pick that person as a leader because he can be a bridge, you know, to people like that. So the point is, you are being mindful about the culture that's being shaped in the congregation or in the organization, and you're intentionally trying to, you know, create that unity, that sense of belonging and oneness, that though we are people, we are all people from different parts of the country, we come from different backgrounds, but when we are part of the church, the congregation, the community, the family of God, we should feel, you know, we belong. And, uh, and, and we need to intentionally create that unity, that fellowship, that sense of belonging, right? So um, just wanted to share that. Okay. Any questions, any thoughts? Christopher, go ahead, please. Uh, yes, Pastor. So I, I guess, you know, just in sort of, uh, you know, listening to what you just now mentioned, um, there is also, you know, you know, just broadly speaking, you know, in people who come to churches uh, also have, um, uh, there is a, there is a, uh, a certain uh, uh, difference between you know the the people who are uh, who are financially um, rich and and the ones who are you know are going through the difficult times and who are possibly you know poor, you know you could define them as poor you know and uh, uh, also personally speaking you know uh, given that you know I I have come from a denominational church uh, before. Where um, uh, there have been, uh, I mean, I, 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 I mean, I've actually seen this, you know, where there a lot of poor people kind of converged, you know, to the, to that their denominational church, where they actually seek uh, arms and you know the arms as in they they want uh, they want money, uh, you know, from from people from parishioners in the, in the church. Um, I also feel that. Um, you know, sometimes the, the 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 there is a difference in in the way yeah, uh, people who are uh, you know well off uh, financially the the way they they uh, they, they pray and uh, you know the the you know the the difference in you know how uh, uh, how they pray and you know the people who are who are poor who you know sometimes you know they are they are more desperate prayers because you know there are they 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 need uh, you know some some basic uh, sort of um, um, mm. uh, you know from the, you know basic things in life basically you know have, basically it'll be I mean, just getting getting food on the tables for example mm. yeah. um, so I just wanted to try to get you know I try to understand you know from an, from an all people's church perspective um, how you know that you know, that is taken care of. Or how it you know, sort of you know, works uh, across that the you know that sort of uh, you know the, the dynamics between you know the, the rich and the poor and uh, um, and how you know how that is sort of you know taken care of because um, um, yeah I mean you know, is this something that yeah I just thought I'd, I just uh, I mean I thought of you know when we were talking about the uh, the uh, you know the Western culture and the the ones who come from from more local sort of yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah, definitely. This is another, you know, cultural divide, so to speak. So there are, you know, as a as as a church, I think in any part of the world, um, culture uh, there can be the culture between, you know, this like you're saying, the financial social standing. Uh, another big culture divide that we had to work on was the age. You know, the older and the younger the youth and the elders. That's again another cultural divide that we have to be very mindful of. But just to answer your question on the financial part, uh, that is true. That, uh, you know, there, there are people who come, you know, who are very rich, doing well, and then there are those who are not so rich or who are just barely 
you know, keeping their life together. So um, what we've tried to do, you know, one is to treat everybody equally. So uh, and here, here's some thoughts, and I'll just try to be very brief on this. One is we try, as a pastoral team, we try to treat everybody equally. And one of the ways we do that is no pastor knows who is giving how much money. No pastor knows it. So the pastors don't know. You know, so and so is giving so much, and so and so is giving so much. They have no idea on the financial contribution. Now, I know for some extent because I have to work directly with our accountant on many many things uh, uh, to my son. But in my mind, I block out any preferential treatment of any person. Now, I don't know what everybody is giving. I don't know that 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 information even I don't know. But in certain cases, I'm. Things when things are you know escalated and come brought to my attention, then I might know. But in general, none of our pastors know who is giving how much. So that means when they minister to people, whether when people come for prayer or ministry, there is no bias. You know, oh, this person is giving more versus this. No, but of course, you know, by looking at people economically, you will know. Okay. This person is doing better and this person. But from our pastoral perspective, our hearts are to serve everybody equally, whether they are, you know, regardless of where they are in the financial spectrum, we serve everyone equally the same way. And we treat everybody equally. It means when people come, they, everybody sits on the same chairs. Uh, everybody, you know, there's no special place for anybody who's rich or poor. Now, everybody comes, you find your own place. Nobody's going to escort the rich person to the front row. Nobody's going to escort. You know, we've had hmm, this was uh, 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 we've had these times. You know, when the ch chief minister, of, you know, of a particular state, their family was attending church. We don't bother. You come, you're coming because you're coming. They come with bodyguards, etc. But we don't treat them any different. They come, they sit, they listen, they go. So we don't treat them any different, and you know, so uh, whether they are politicians, whoever, you know, they all, we all, everybody is given the same kind of chair to sit. You sit where you want. Nobody's going to escort you to any place. Nothing, you know. So from a pastoral team side, from the beginning till today, we treat everybody equally. Now, we need to know how to meet the needs of people. So what we have set up, and we set this up some years ago, uh, we set up a generosity fund. That means people in the church who have extra money can contribute to the generosity fund, and people who have a need can request for money. But then we have a process, because if we don't have a process to check and verify, then it could be abused. So we have a form that people have to fill up, and we give only for certain things, like for buying uh, immediate, immediate needs, like food, groceries. You know, if somebody's lost a job or something, we give towards that. Uh, we give towards rent, housing rent, so people have place to stay. And we give a lot towards education. So a lot, a lot of money goes for the education of children. And fourthly is medical expenses. Right? But people have to fill up a form. And they're to send it in. And every year that happens. And it happens very quietly. So we don't announce saying, oh, we gave so much money to this family and so much money to that family. We don't announce it. People know there's a generosity fund of if people reach out to any other pastors, we say, hey, you, you're then financial help. Okay. You have to fill up this form, send it in. It'll be reviewed. And uh, we give money, but we also help them out in terms of getting some financial training so that they can you know, manage their money and so on. So that's kind of the way we've tried to address it. It's not a complete solution, but at least in part, it addresses the needs of people. Is that okay? All right, so um, we will close for now. I, I just, uh, Abraham, I see your question there about uh, uh, the, age divide, and I, I tell you, that was a problem we also faced here at APC, and uh, I'll just share some things that we did in trying to address that, but we'll pick it up in the next class next week. Is that okay? I will just have a close for today. I just wanted to close about 10 minutes early uh, so I can head out. Um,
yeah, so um, sorry for rushing away. I just want somebody to please pray with us and then uh, we'll close the class for today. Okay, really appreciate all your discussions, your questions, uh, sharing of ideas. Um, it's really good. Could somebody please pray with us and dismiss us, please? Can I pray, Pastor? Thank you, Asha. Go ahead. Dear God, thank you so much for your loving kindness, Lord. I pray right now, Lord, that as we learn about culture, Lord, that we may understand it and help it to apply in our lives, God. And thank you so much for everything, Lord, as Pastor Asha, she's going, Lord, a very safe journey, Lord. And you knew we declare that Psalms 91 over his life, God, that he, he is protected and shielded with your love, God. Thank you for everything that you're doing. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, catch up next week. God bless. Enjoy the rest of your day. And uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. God bless. Thank you, Pastor. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah,